So last week I told you how Gene and I started reading books soon after he had a stroke, and one of the books um, we read was On Call by Dr. Thompson, and then we read Beyond the Mist by Dr. Thompson, and then I wrote him a letter and said, I want to come meet you. <laughs> and he said, come on up. So Gene and I drove up to Reading and had dinner with him, and um, I later was having coffee with Nancy, and I said, I've got a speaker for you. <laughs> So anyway, I asked him if he would come, and he said yes. So then I also wrote him a couple of days ago and said, could you bring some of the books you've written? <laughs> so some of them are in the back on the table, and maybe he'll talk about those a little bit further on. But I won't take up too much time, and I want to give him plenty. So this is Dr. David Thompson, my new friend. Well, it's afternoon, I guess. So good afternoon. Um, and for the books back there, uh, it cost me, I buy them from uh, the publisher and then I sell them with uh, the cost, uh, what it cost me to buy them and ship for them to ship them. So I could sell them for like uh, $8.27, but that makes it very complicated. So I just sell them for $10. And uh, so they're on the back table. The, the, uh, the book on Christian Mercy was the most recent one, and I self-published that one, so I have those more of them in a box down below. Um, the other books, there are just a few of them, and Beyond the Mist is not, there are no copies of that, but you can order those from either um, Moody Publishing, or you can just go online and get them. And all of the books, including my last one, Christian Mercy, are on Kindle. So if you don't want to have to pay as much, you can just read it on Kindle. And now even on Kindle, most of the books, you can have, have audio. There's not very much good news these days. And I think that it's easy to conclude that, um, you know, the devil is really so busy, there's no time for, for God to be working. And that um, the pressure on Christians around the world is keeping God from uh, doing his great work. But um, if anything, it is pushing people to the kingdom, into the kingdom. Um, and so I want to tell you this story. It's, it, uh, it's a story I call Small Beginnings, because um, you, if, if you know anything about my story, and Becky and I have been here to the church twice in the last, uh, I guess, 12 years or so, or maybe longer. But um, there's a verse in... Uh, Zechariah 4.10 that says, Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. And that's, that's sort of our story. Um, Becky and I, my wife Becky and I, knew each other uh, at the mission school. Her parents were missionaries in Vietnam, and uh, my parents were missionaries in Cambodia. I, they took me out when I was about uh, six months old, and uh, I spent, we spent many years there. Um, and they were working with uh, Cambodian uh, people and uh, who were Buddhist, and that was very difficult uh, to win Cambodians to, to Christ. Maybe turn this microphone off. I don't know if that's where the echoing is coming from. Um, so, <clears throat> and then tribal people, the tribal people in eastern Cambodia and across the border in, in Vietnam, they asked my, my parents to come and share the gospel with them because they had heard about it. And so uh, I, that's, I grew up in Cambodia, and my wife grew up in Vietnam, and we met at the mission school. And it was in our later years at the mission school that we really f started feeling independently of each other, God calling us to be medical missionaries. Um, and so in 1974, we got married. And for sec next slide there. And... Uh, the verse, our, our verse that my, my mother had given me and Becky's mother had given her, her mother and father had given her, was Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. And so, you know, my mother, when I, I remember when she told me that verse, I was a senior in high school and I thought, oh, yeah, I can do that. That's what, you know, what's the big deal? You know, I've been trusting God since I was... Uh, uh, you know, much younger and, and asked Christ into my life. But you know much better 
that uh, that means trusting God through all the hard things in life as well. And there were some hard things that happened. So next slide is a picture of my wife and I when soon after we got married. I, I, I promise you that is me. I did once have hair, um, but you know what happens to hair. Anyway, um, uh, so we felt God was calling us. I went to I got went to medical school at the University of Pittsburgh. She did nursing school uh, up in Seattle. And um, then while we were in school, we met. We had kind of forgotten about each other. We were both on the same track. Uh, we have really, really uh, fell in love and got married then. Um, but we thought God was going to call us back to Asia, back to where our parents had been. And both of us had, had lost one or both of our parents. Um, my parents were killed in 1968 at the Tet Offensive. They were... Uh, they had moved to Vietnam because Cambodia had closed. You, know, you remember probably better than most Americans that Nixon bombed eastern Cambodia and the king was furious and he said, all Americans out. And so we had to leave. But my folks had been preaching to this tribal people that also lived across the border in Vietnam. And so they decided to go there to try and reach them because until, for, for the 11 years that they had been preaching to the tribal people, not one had come to Christ. And so they, they decided that God wanted them to go to Vietnam. They really heard a clear call, even though the war was going on. Now, Becky's parents had 10 years before that, or a little less than that, I guess it was about five years before that. Um, they had been put in charge of a leprosy hospital in the Central Highlands uh, city of Ban Mituit. And some of you may know Betty Mitchell. Well, that's my wife's mother and father, Archie Mitchell. Anyway, they had been put in charge of that, that uh, leprosy hospital where, uh, and it really, really was a, a beautiful story because prior to that, t prior to um, that leprosy hospital, uh, people who developed leprosy in the tribal villages were sent into the forest to die uh, so they wouldn't spread it to anyone else. It was, it was terrible and, and thousands of people uh, contracted leprosy. So um, when the hospital came, it all of a sudden there was a complete change because they were treated with medications. They got to go back to their families eventually. Um, many of them needed surgery. Some were so, so badly deformed that they had to stay there the rest of their lives. But the communists uh, didn't like that, that the Americans were getting any credit for this. And they, they were, of course, the communists are very much against uh, Christianity. And so they came in and took Becky's father and the doctor and uh, a Mennonite agricultural uh, expert who was there teaching them how to grow the leper people, lepers, uh, how to grow cash crops, took them into the jungle and they were never heard of again. So Becky had suffered too. And uh, this verse really meant more to us as time went on. So when we, uh, we thought we were gonna, the Alliance was gonna send us back to Asia so we could continue the work that our parents had done, but the war stopped all that. And so we, had, we couldn't go back, and so they asked us to go to the country of Gabon. Now, Gabon, we had to look on a map to see where, I never heard of Gabon. And uh, it's, it's okay if you didn't either, because there are 54 countries in Africa, and several of them have changed their names in the years and decades past. But Gabon is a city, a country about the size of the state of Colorado. And so, uh, we looked at that and thought, okay, if you got, if you want us to go there, we can do that. And there was a, in the southern part of the country, and I'll show that next slide map. The southern part of the country, uh, there was a very large region there uh, that about a third of the country had essentially no medical health care. And so the alliance was asking us to go in there. That we had missionaries there, we had pastors there, but their children were dying. And um, there were about 200 people, 200,000 people. Um, no hospitals, no doctors, no nurses, nothing. Uh, at that time, when we got there, uh, we found that three out of five children were dying before the age of five from a variety of diseases. There were epidemics of uh, measles, of um, whooping cough, which is pertussis, and uh, polio. Um, every child had malaria. And so these, uh, the schools were almost empty. And um, many adults were dying as well from surgical disease. Uh, and so there was, uh, there was an overwhelming need there. 
Um, so we started, we got there and, and we uh, said, okay, uh, where are we going to be going? And the missionaries who were there already, they said, well, um, you're going to be going down to the southern part of the country and uh, there's a good road down there. So this, is the, this was the next slide was the first part of the road um, and uh, it looked really good. But uh, I have to tell you that this part of the road now is nothing but mud right now, all these years later. Um, because of logging trucks that don't uh, weigh their loads and they just destroyed it. So the government has to rebuild it. But we kept going, next slide, and uh, the pavement ended and, and the road just got narrower and narrower and we started getting a little concerned that we might be going to a really remote place. Um, and so we kept going and the bridges were very interesting, here's one of them. Um, and uh, fortunately I have a very, you know, uh, courageous wife and she would go out there and pull some boards around and stomp on it and if she didn't go down then I figured the car could go across so. and uh, she survived all those years. Um, and when we finally got to Bongolo, it was 350 miles, it took us two days of driving with uh, some of the other missionaries uh, leading the way. Uh, and they showed us now, they said, okay, we have a little dispensary there, uh, here where you can start. Uh, some missionary nurses had started this and ne there it was. I thought, uh, really, really primitive. I mean, looks pretty good from the outside, but as you got closer, uh, there was, you know, the reason that there's no paint on the bottom part of the building was that about a hundred goats had been born under the eaves of that building and goats will always sleep where they were born. And then, um, they have parasites and so they'll, they, I don't know if you can see the brown line around it, but they rub their butts on it. And so this was the hosp this was the dispensary. You could not get in without stepping on goat poop. So that was of course my first challenge. Uh, I started, had to shoot the goats with a pellet gun to get them to leave and so forth, it was a long battle. And it's all chronicled in the book On Call and some of the funniest things that happened in my life. Um, but uh, I was the only doctor, and you can show that next slide, and my wife Becky was uh, one of uh, four nurses. Um, we really knew nothing about building hospitals, and uh, so, uh, but we had the Lord with us. And you know, the Lord, there is no resource like God. No resource like God. All the money in the world is nothing compared to his knowledge and wisdom. And so we just trusted in him day by day, Next slide shows uh, where we lived. It was really, we were in the rainforest. So uh, that's a river that went all the way around and there was uh, falls over to the right there and uh, the early missionaries had built a small hydroelectric plant that produced just enough electricity to light a, a bulb in each room and um, the, our housing started there and then went down the hill and over in the valley on the other side was where that dispensary was. So th this is where we started and, and to get across that river, next slide, they had something they called a ferry but really it was just a raft and, and you got on it and, and then you had to drag those, those heavy, um, uh, they called them passerelles but there were these things you drove on and dumped them and, and you set them down on each side and you drove off and if you got it wrong, why you got wet. So it was, it was an interesting experience and every time that we went into town we had to go across that river uh, with that and, and you see the cable there, the guy's pulling it, so you pulled yourself across and there was a cable that hooked it to another, to a pulley uh, so it wouldn't just go down river. But um, there was high school students that would jump on there too and sometimes we ended up almost underwater. So that was a challenge, um, but you didn't have to go on the ferry if there was a car on the other side. Next slide shows that there was another way you could ride in this big canoe. And that's my wife Becky with uh, our, our youngest son in the oven and our um, middle son who's now a pastor in, in Reading and uh, our daughter who was a missionary in, in Cambodia for some years and then later in Gabon. So um, we would get in that big long canoe which is dug out and then the guy in the front would hold onto the cable and go across. And if, if, he, if he lost his balance, everybody went downriver for a while and, there were, and it was just a mess, which happened about once a month. So there were all, all kinds of challenges that we faced. Um, next slide shows, uh, we, it took us three years uh, to get funding to build and equip our first uh, 
building. We we actually did a survey in the in the t in the village and about a hundred houses to find out what were the diseases, what were the biggest needs, and the biggest needs were maternity. Uh, one out of twenty women were dying in childbirth, and um, and the, the vaccinations, and the third was surgical disease. Um, about every fourth man had a hernia, and most men were dying um, from hernias in their mid fifties. So it was just a, an incredible thing. So God provided uh, funding. We built that first building. Uh, and Becky had a great idea. She said, you know, there's, we're never going to be enough for all these people. We have to train and disciple nurses. And so the next slide shows uh, Becky doing that. Um, and the next slide over the next 30 years, uh, she set up a nursing school and trained nurses, midwives. This is with other missionary nurses who joined her. Um, we even trained uh, lab techs, x-ray techs, whatever we needed, except surgeons. We, I was the only surgeon. And uh, I had done my residency, five-year residency in California in general surgery. And uh, so I had plenty to do. Uh, in, in addition, you know, people ask me, well, what kind of surgery do you, do you do? And I said, well, I am the only surgeon in about 500 miles in any direction. So I do the skin and its contents. Um, but, uh, you know, that included doing C-sections uh, and uh, once we had our operating rooms up and doing uh, a lot of uh, burns. We treated a lot of burns with uh, grafting, skin grafts, and did uh, tonsillectomies and did hysterectomies and did uh, bowel obstructions. Just anything you can think of, people came in with uh, terrible fractures and uh, rotting femurs and things like that. So over the years, we, we did uh, thousands of operations. And for each, each operation, we would always pray with the patient. And we had chaplains at the hospital that would share the gospel with our, our patients and people. Uh, it took about 15 years of people watching us. But when the nurses um, that Becky had discipled really started showing the love of Christ to patients, and they themselves living for Christ, um, that's when the Africans said, this is not just a white man's religion. This is for us too. Look, and they could see the families were prospering, these of our, our nurses, both men and women. Um, and they were raised, had children who were healthy and God was watching over all of us. We had brought vaccines in and vaccinated in all the villages and stopped the epidemics. Um, and, uh, but those were very hard times because uh, during that year, that first year, we had over 500 children come to the dispensary and die there in front of us because we had nothing and no vaccines. Uh, but God helped us turn that around over the years. Next slide, um, again, more nursing school pictures. And uh, the nursing school really became one of the best ones in the country, although the government refused to accredit it. They would always hire as many of our nurses as they could pull away. Um, but it was also a discipling, a discipleship program. And uh, it was just so amazing to see these, these young people, as they learn the skills of nursing, also learn how to share the gospel with their patients. Um, they would do a lot of different things. Uh, they had... Um, they had these little uh, books, booklets that they could show to the people, but they especially learned how to give their own testimonies, how they came to faith in Christ, how that changed their life and uh, changed even the lives of their parents in many cases. Um, this is a picture of two of her students who be, actually became missionaries. One, the one on the left became an ophthalmologist. Uh, he, is, he and his wife, are, uh, who is a physician, actually a Chinese-English physician, they are, have, are in uh, the Republic of Congo, which is the country just below Gabon, and uh, they have set up uh, an eye clinic, an eye hospital there, and then they trained people to do everything but the, the operation, and then they've gone to a more, uh, another part of the Republic of Congo near the capital city, and they've built a second eye center, and these are eye centers for the poor. Uh, people come and either get free operations or pay $20. Um, and it's, I mean, thousands of people have, have had their sight restored, mainly from cataracts. Um, and uh, it's just a beautiful story. The other young man there on the right, uh, he was um, uh, born in a Muslim village up in northern Cameroon. And uh, when he was down in the capital city, he met a Christian who, they were both taxi drivers. And over a seven-year period, his friend won him to faith in Christ. 
And when he went back to his village and he told his family that he had become a Christian, um, his mother poisoned him. Uh, but in the morning he woke up and he was fine. And she said, I, you're supposed to be dead. I gave you, I gave you poison. And she became a Christian. Um, but the whole village then, uh, they, they tried to kill him. They did kill his mother. Uh, it was it's a very sad story. So he fled to Gabon and um, moved. And then he heard about our nursing school, came to the nursing school uh, way down there in the south and got trained as a nurse. Then trained, we had um, anesthesiologists come and he was trained as a, a nurse anesthetist. And uh, then he and his wife, uh, who was our nursing supervisor, they, they went up to uh, another hospital that was just starting up in the country of Guinea, Hope Clinic, and uh, he, was, he served there as a, a missionary nurse anesthetist and evangelist for 20 years, he and his wife. They just retired and returned uh, to Gabon. So God was really showing us that the importance of multiplying ourselves is not enough. One of the rules that we, we made is to never do anything without teaching somebody else. And you know, we know so many things. I, I mean, we know how to mow a grass, so we, we taught people how to mow grass. But that's not enough. You have to teach them how to keep the thing running. You have to know, you have to know how to uh, teach them to change the spark plug or whatever it is, and, and uh, uh, many other things, welding and, and plumbing and electricity. And so all of these things uh, that I initially had to do, but later on we had uh, uh, maintenance people come out and join our team. Um, so next slide. After after 15 years, this is this is what our hospital looked like. So from that one little dispensary, God had given us money to build a number of buildings, and again and again we saw the Lord as we trusted in Him. We saw Him uh, uh, just um, making the path straight for us, making a way for us to go forward. Um, it, it, there were many hardships. I mean, uh, at this point in my life, I was working uh, between 80 and 100 hours a week. Uh, in surgery, and um, and I started complaining, um, not to the mission, to the Lord, and I said, Lord, you you've got to send me help, um, and uh, skip the next slide and go on to the map. Um, this was the area that we where the predominance of our patients came from, almost a third of the country of Gabon, two hundred thousand people with no no surgeons. Uh, a few doctors would come from the government from time to time. And that red dot there is a bungalow. And so uh, we were seeing all these people come in and from all kinds of things. This was my operating room. Uh, our initial, turn the, the next slide, um, equipment was uh, MASH and you couldn't adjust the operating table. I mean, that was the height it was at. So um, it was pretty miserable for my back at the beginning. Next slide. But, uh, you know, accidents were very common, and you can see why. I mean, those, that car, that tr little pickup truck, has maybe 10 people in it with all that baggage, and it's going down the road at about 40 miles an hour. Dirt roads. So there were always, they were turning over, people were getting hurt, killed, and everything. Um, and so we just had, and then this to the right here is uh, a burn patient that required a lot of work. And um, next slide. Uh, we had uh, so many burn kids who were burned because they had fires in their kitchens. They, they would build just a mud brick house behind the main house, a dirt floor, and they would cook on a fire, open fire, and just so often these children would get burned, and very severe burns. So um, my children were growing up, next slide, they were growing up fast. I had three children, and um, I was spending too little time with them. And I didn't know what to do. I kept praying. Um, and, and my wife, uh, Becky, bless her, she was, she was like, honey, you can't go on like this. Next slide shows the two of us about that time. And, um, and I knew I was going to burn out. It was just a matter of time. I, I was going to burn out. And uh, so, I, but I kept praying and the Lord, the Lord didn't answer for some reason. I mean, so many of my prayers were answered. All those buildings and more that followed, uh, you know, we'd pray and ask God, Lord, we need $200,000. And one time we came home and we said, and we needed a quarter of a million dollars. And on the last day, the last church, a little tiny church that had not more than 50 people in it, um, somebody had, told us, uh, heard about all of our needs, and uh, he said, and he wrote us after we went back to the field, and he said, uh, we, got a, um, we got an inheritance that we don't need. 
could you use a quarter of a million dollars? I mean, God just did this kind of stuff. But why wouldn't he send someone to help me? I mean, I was a little upset about this. Um, well, one day, uh, turn on next slide, as I was praying, in, I, and I would get up early every morning to spend time with the Lord. I learned to do that to, just to survive. And so it was about five o'clock, and I was praying by myself, and I said, Lord, you, I don't know what to do. You have to, please help me. And um, the Lord said to me just three words. You train them. And I thought, well, that was a random thought. Uh, and, and went right back to praying. And again, the Lord said, David, you train them. And I thought, that, this, that's impossible. I'm already working as hard as I possibly can. How could I start a residency program? I mean, just I just said, Lord, I can't do this. And, he, and the Lord just, when I would pray him, it, I, I knew what he was saying. He wasn't giving in. And so um, the next year, uh, the CMDA, Christian Medical and Dental Association, had a conference in Kenya, and we were invited to, to join them for continuing medical education. They would invite all these, they'd been doing this for about a decade, and they would invite all missionaries, medical missionaries, to come, and they would have courses and volunteer professors from the United States who were Christians. And so I went to this, uh, this uh, conference. There were about uh, three or 400 missionaries there and a bunch of surgeons. There were about 10 surgeons, and we were all in the same boat. I mean, we were all just near exhaustion. And so the Lord had given me an idea in the months that followed uh, that t day I, I prayed, and he said, you, you train them. The idea that he gave me was that if we had at every mission hospital or Christian hospital where we had a board-certified North American trained surgeon, if we could set up a residency program, uh, you know, a five-year residency program. We could get, you know, curriculum, and we could train them, and we could get visiting surgeons maybe to come from the States short term. We could, we could train African surgeons, and we could disciple them too. So I proposed this. And uh, there were a group of uh, nine other surgeons there, and they said, yeah, let's do this. And so we, we made a, we created an organization called the Pan-African Academy of Christian Surgeons, PACS. And I have a brochure back there just so you can get the website if you ever want to just go look on it, because there may be doctors that you know, Christian doctors, who need to go out and uh, volunteer short term for, uh, to help out in these places. So. We all decided we'd go back to our hospitals and we would start residency programs. So we went back to our, the, our hospital and uh, um, I put the word out and somebody who'd been at the conference and heard about what we had done and we'd started this organization contacted me and said, from Angola and said, I've got a young doctor here at our mission hospital. Can I send him? We'll support him. I said, okay. So he was our first resident and uh, in the next slide you'll see him there. Uh, sitting with the arrow pointing down on his head. Uh, his name was Paulo Baltazar, a uh, very interesting guy. Uh, I could tell you a hundred stories about him, but um, anyway, he was our first resident. And then the next year, uh, and he started off, and uh, next year there was one from Madagascar, and then again, uh, this was a Lutheran hospital that sent him and, and uh, supported him. And uh, uh, then the next year we got somebody else. I mean, it just started going. And, and so we, I taught these guys how to operate. And uh, I taught them, you know, how to do C-sections. Next slide. And we were having about a C-section a night, so it was great for me. I got some sleep finally uh, when these guys had been trained well enough to do it on their own. Um, and um, that was, and by 1999, we had, uh, we had three residents. And uh, we started getting visiting doctors from, the, um, from, from churches in the States, not Alliance Church, any church. I mean, they were, from, they were Christians. They wanted to uh, share this, what, the skills that God had given them. They wanted to teach it to these young men. They wanted to share their testimonies with them, these young men and women, too, because our, second, our third resident was a woman. Um, and so we really wanted to focus on Jesus um, because, you know, if we... If a doctor like me goes and helps somebody with their broken leg and they get their leg fixed, uh, all I've done is prolonged their life and given them more mobility, but they're still going to die and go to hell if they don't know Christ. 
If they don't know Jesus, that he came and he died for them and that God has this plan, this unbelievable plan that the whole world, if they hear, they can be saved. And so uh, we taught our residents to pray with our, with our patients. Nobody gets offended when you pray. I'd pray with Muslims. I'd say, can I pray for you? And then they'd say, well, sure, go ahead. You know, and I'd pray, Lord Jesus, please help this Muslim man to know that you love him and you died for his sins. Well, I mean, what's he going to say? All they can say is amen. Um, so um, anyway, there are other ways too. And in, um, we started seeing people come to faith in Christ at the hospital. And one of the reasons was because they were seeing Africans whose lives were transformed by Jesus. And they knew that was a miracle. They knew that's nothing in their sphere of uh, religion. And so people started responding, and, and in 1995, that was the first year we had uh, 600 people come to faith in Christ. The next year it was 1,000, and then some years it was more than 1,000, and for the next 30 years, we've had 1,000 people every year come to faith in Christ. So there are churches popping up everywhere. Not all of them, of course, go to end up in churches, but we do our best to do follow-up, our chaplains do. In 1999, next slide, uh, we had a breakthrough, and after 17 years of praying, um, the United States, Canada, and Gabon paid for a million-dollar bridge across our river. And uh, previous to that, uh, patients who came during the night, they could not cross until the morning because there was nobody there to run the ferry. We had people die on the other side of the river. It was really sad. Uh, so with that bridge, that was a huge blessing. Uh, in 2000, next slide, we had our first uh, woman. Uh, how would you like to have a last name like that? Razana Mam Pionina. Uh, the, the, the Malagazis had the longest second names. Uh, there was one that had 56 letters in his name. Anyway, um, she joined us from Madagascar, and uh, she was the first uh, uh, PAX surgeon to be trained, woman to be trained. Now there are many. So the best thing was, next slide, two years after, or three years after I started training residents, I got my life back. Because now I had a team. I had residents in their third year, second year, who knew how to do C-sections. They, they could take care of a patient that came in in the middle of the night and do the right things. And at the very worst, they, they might call me, but usually they didn't have to. And then um, over time, it, it just got better and better. And uh, I had time for my family. I could go on vacation with my family. We would go to the coast and spend a camp on the beach. And when I come back, there wouldn't be a list of people who had died while I was gone. And that was a hard thing. Um, next slide. After five years, um, the first resident graduated. Um, on the left, uh, on the right was the first resident, but he had to, we, we had to switch our curriculum from French to English, and he had to spend a year learning English, and then he, but he eventually graduated. Um, so next slide. My, my son is very artistic. Uh, he made it, he drew that uh, logo for us, and that still is our logo, logo for the Pan-African College. And that, um, some people have made snide remarks about that being a, a corpse on the coffin, but that is not. That's an operating table, and that's a patient there waiting to have surgery. <laughs> and a surgeon on each side, an African one, and somebody from America. So, um, the... PAX then, as we called it, Pan-African Academy of Christian Sur Surgeons, um, it really uh, would eventually revive um, many Christian hospitals and revive the witness of many Christian hospitals. And I'll explain to you a little bit why and how. Um, the next slide shows, uh, uh, these are just a few. These are just a few. Uh, Bongolo has graduated 19 surgeons and they're in, um, um, I think they're in 12 different countries. John and Cecilia Arduno, um, they're now in their 10th year at Hope Clinic in Guinea and uh, just do an extraordinary job. Um, this is a, Guinea is probably one of the poorest five countries in the world and the lowest ratio of doctors and surgeons to patients. Um, it has probably fewer for, uh, I think, uh, 7 million people. I think it has fewer than seven surgeons, uh, trained surgeons. A lot of people do surgery, but they're not trained. Uh, here's another one. Next slide. Philadelphia and Rochelle Dembele. He's from Mali. He, uh, he is actually 
at the hospital in Kuchala. He's been there now. This is his, uh, I think this is his seventh or eighth year. And because, because of missionaries uh, in the region being um, taken as hostages, most of them were European missionaries, uh, the Alliance had to pull all of our personnel out of Kuchala Hospital. We had a team of about uh, 12 missionaries, doctors, nurses, other experts, and uh, they all had to come out. And so he is now the only surgeon there. A uh, very excellent surgeon, um, but we're trying to get him to find other Christian doctors and, and send them to us to train in surgery. And we, PAX now has, as you'll see, we have many training programs, uh, not just general surgery. So that's Dembola. Here's another one, Jean-Claude and Christine Batineni. Uh, Jean-Claude uh, was from the Democratic Republic of Congo. He went back to a hospital that was actually uh, uh, founded um, by Helen Rosevere. How many of you have read Helen, any of Helen Rosevere's books? You ought to Google it. She's the most incredible British missionary, medical missionary I've ever met. She's about this tall. And uh, just wonderful books that she's written and, and the story that she told in, of Congo. But he went back and rebuilt that hospital, got funding for it, um, and he's just a, a wonderful surgeon and, and the only surgeon for now about half a million people. So what he has done is he has uh, had interns come from the medical school in that region, and then during their internship, he teaches them to do cesarean sections and a few other basic operations. Um, so, and he's having a huge influence and in, in sharing the gospel with patients and uh, leading people to faith. Ten years, next slide, ten years after I, um, we started PACS, uh, Dr. Keir Thielander joined us, so during all that time I was still the only surgeon, but I had residents working with me. So he joined me, and for the first time we had two faculty surgeons. Most of the PACS programs now in Africa have three, uh, and uh, that works much better. So uh, ten years later he would, uh, he would uh, take my place as executive vice president of PACS, and uh, he's still in that role. Um, and, and PAX is, is really thriving. So just to show you what ha has happened to the hospital in the 32 years, the next slide uh, shows you it's really grown. Uh, it now has 150 beds um, and all kinds of things are happening. It, it is the one of five hospitals in the country of Gabon that treat HIV positive patients and also that, uh, that treat um, patients with resistant tuberculosis. Uh, and uh, right now we have a general surgery residency program, we have a nurse anesthetist training program, we have the nursing program, we have a midwifery program, uh, training program, and uh, ophthalmology training program. So it's really become a, uh, a, uh, an institution, or I guess you would call it an, an educational institute. Um, the government has not recognized it because we first have to be an, a university, and so that's going to take time. We have to have a professor or somebody to be the professor over it, and uh, it's very complicated, but it doesn't matter. These, these are some of the best trained um, specialists now coming out of this hospital and serving, at not just where we are, but uh, different places in Africa. To just show you what's happening with PACS, the next slide shows you what, what's happened with PACS. Those are the countries where we have PACS training programs. There are 12 of them. And there are going to be two more next year. Uh, Burundi is going to come and it's going to be added. And um, we have graduated uh, actually 120 uh, surgeons since, um, since the beginning in 1997 was the first resident that we took. And we have uh, graduates are serving in 22 countries now, not just 21. And I'll show you the, the slide of that. Uh, so this had eight countries with training programs. It's now 12. 17 different training programs. Um, most of them, about a, a, a third or half of them are general surgery, but we also have orthopedics. Um, we have neurosurgery. We've got uh, pediatric surgery, um, plastic surgery. I mean, the list just goes on and on. Um, so it's really an amazing thing. and and. I started out as being the only faculty surgeon in PACS. Today, we have 100 faculty surgeons, and 80% of them are missionaries. The other 20% are graduates from our, our training program. So that's, that's God. You know, God is on the move. 
we read all about it, but there's so much bad news, we can get discouraged. But I want to tell you that God is not, he's not hindered by that. He uses, um, he even uses the devil to do, uh, to improve his work and make it stronger. This next slide uh, is a very, very busy slide, but this is where our, our graduates are located. These, we have all these graduates. 100% of our graduates are still working in Africa, and 90% of them are working among the poor, and not, not even in the cities. Uh, even in the cities, though, there are many poor people. So um, we will, right now, we're training another resident from Chad, two of them. They'll go back to Chad. Um, We've trained one from Sudan, but he's not back in Sudan because of the wars. So what God is doing is just more than, more than I could imagine. You know, I had a vision this big. My vision was that God sends me someone to help me. And God didn't want to do that. That's not the way he works. He wanted to build the kingdom. And I was so privileged to be used by him. Um, I just marvel now at, at all that he has done. Um, next slide, in 2014, God called Becky and I to leave Bongolo. There was another surgeon there that actually a surgeon, surgeon couple came. And so they didn't really need me and it was too early for us to retire at 65. So um, we were invited by the Anglican Bishop from Egypt who is a wonderful, uh, godly man who loves the word of God and evangelism and he's always in trouble with the Muslims because of that. Um, and he invited us to come and ad begged us to come and, and start a nursing school at this hospital uh, in, uh, in the D Nile Delta called, in a town called Manouf. Um, and uh, also a, a surgical, another PAX program. So we went there for five years and we did that, and that's a whole other story. Um, so, uh, next slide. This is my wife, Becky, and uh, you know, uh, Loving God means obeying Him, and uh, that includes His call to take Jesus to the world in however way we can. And many of you supported us. You know, um, there was a principle in the Old Testament that David established, and that was that when he and his soldiers went and raided a camp, the ones who stayed behind and guarded, guarded their, their, their camp and all of their weapons and all of their food supply and everything, when the others came back with all this uh, booty that they had gotten, they had to share it with those who stayed behind. That's the same principle God has. If you sent Becky and I out there, you will also receive the reward for reaching these people for Christ. Not just the people in Gabon, but all of the places where God has sent our disciples. That's God's way. So um, I want to encourage you to, to keep giving for, to support missionaries and take them in the other parts of the world. You're part of that very important team, the, prayer, the, the financial support team, but also the prayer support team. Um, and there's so many times, I can, uh, so many situations where we would send a prayer request I remember one day, uh, Becky, something happened to her and she suddenly developed terrible vertigo. And um, she was throwing up and she, you know, she, she could only lay in bed like this, even to eat was difficult for her. And so um, I wrote to an ENT specialist that I knew and he said, okay, have her lay in the head with her head back and, and throw her head back. And she did that and it didn't work. And he had, I mean, we did all these things. They got a little better, but. She, this went on and on. She couldn't eat. She started losing weight. She lost 20 pounds over the next two months. And so we were getting ready to, uh, uh, we had sent out word to uh, all of our friends and through our newsletter asking people to pray for God to heal her. And we had, uh, I had asked the, the African pastors at our church to, uh, there in Bongolo to come and pray for her and they'd prayed for her and she still had it. And um, so, um, I, you know, I anointed her with oil and prayed with some of our missionaries, and she still had it. And so we were we were in the capital city, Libreville, and we were thinking about, okay, we're going to have to we're going to have to go home and and see what is what can be done. But there were just so many things going on right then. It, it was it was going to mean really some major problems at the hospital and in caring for people. And um, so we were there with our 
our, our missionaries in Libreville, our field director, and, and our, about six or seven of the missionaries in the capital city. And uh, we were having a little farewell party for some missionaries who were going to be moving down to the Republic of Congo to serve there. And so I went to the field director and I said, uh, you know, we've prayed for Becky three times now and anointed her with oil and she still can't, she can't eat. And she was there at this party, but she could only sit. I said, could you pray for her? <clears throat> so we prayed one more time. And uh, it was just a simple prayer. The field director and the others laid hands on her and prayed for her healing. Next morning she woke up, it was gone. It was gone. It wasn't just the prayers of these missionaries, but all of our friends back home too who were praying. And she never had it again. So uh, God has just um, used all of us together. Uh, you know, in this last slide, I have a, a, one of my favorite verses. I tell these stories, and there's so many, and there are stories in the book, you know, and they're just so incredible. Um, but it's, it's God doing these things. We're able to do these incredible ministries because God is with us, and God is hearing and answering prayer. And so Psalm 115 means a great deal to us. Not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to your name, to your name goes all the glory. He's the one that has done all of this. Your glory for your unfailing love and faithfulness. Your name go, gets, goes, to your name goes all the glory. And I, and I just want to end on that, on that note. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have, but I want to end on that note. Um, you know, the, it, one of the things that I, I learned as a missionary was that if I wanted God to do things to help me, I needed to spend time with him. Well, I mean, I, I would get up at 6 o'clock in the morning and I would work until 8 o'clock at night. So where was their time? And I heard a South African pastor one day on the radio, and he said, um, you know, he said, uh, we have time for everything else, but we don't have time for God. So he said, I suggest that you would start small. Just start small and build up. So I thought, okay, I'll, uh, <clears throat> I'll get up at, uh, you know, instead of 6 o'clock, I'll get up at 5.45. So I got up at 5.45, and... And I uh, had my devotions, but, you know, and, and that was okay. I felt great. And, and, uh, but after about, a, about three weeks of that, I thought, you know, uh, it's just so short. I never hardly get anywhere, and the time's up. So it went to 20 minutes, and then it went to 30 minutes, and then it went to an hour. And you know what? When I started spending time with God, I started hearing His voice. He would speak to me, like he spoke to me when he said, uh, you train them. That happened to me many times. And uh, when I wasn't sure, I'd say, Lord, I, I, need you to, I need you to confirm that that's you. And God would speak to me again. So um, that's been a huge blessing in my life. And um, I think it's one of the reasons, not there are many reasons, but one of the reasons that God has blessed us through, through our ministries uh, in, in Gabon as medical missionaries. And I appreciate so much uh, your church, and, uh, and, and uh, we, we came here a couple of times, I think, and shared our stories, and, uh, and some of you prayed for us, and some of you um, wrote letters to us and sent us cards, and many of you gave without even maybe knowing us, but you were supporting us and you were sending God's word across the seas. Well, today we have 100 disciples doing that in 22 countries in Africa. And every year, the number goes up 25 more. Every year, we graduate 25 more. The budget for, for PACS is $4 million this year. And I've never asked, you know, I don't raise the money. It's not my job. It's uh, other people. And, uh, but m mainly, it's doctors who have come out and served, and they just said, this is the real thing. And so if you have a doctor friend, um, just uh, take a look at that brochure. Get the, get the, uh, the website for PAX. It's, it's uh, PAX.net, P-A-A-C-S dot net. And there's a whole website there. 
all kinds of places across Africa, all kinds of hospitals. I mean, they're not just Alliance hospitals. They're Baptist hospitals, and they're, um, <clears throat> they're, they're, some of them are just non-denominational, but they're wonderful places of, of training and discipleship today. So um, with that, I'll stop and uh, ask if there are any questions.